M&A analysis. So, for those of you who were part of the previous session, hang on, let me just remove all these bottles behind me. For those of you who are part of the previous panel, we were talking about what makes a really good startup tick, right? What makes it successful, what makes it attractive, but also what makes it investable, right? So now we're talking about the end of that life cycle, right? So we've put some money into a business, the business has grown, we're reasonably happy with it, and then at some point, there's the M&A opportunity, right? So today we're going to be talking about what happens at that stage, right? What should we be looking for as investors, as a startup, what you really should be preparing for when you get to an exit? What has worked? What has failed spectacularly? We're going to be talking about all of that, okay? We have a very, very competent panel with us. Um, over to you. Okay, I'll do a quick introduction. Dave Flynn, CEO for Glidnor Group. Uh, we've been around for about the last four years now. Uh, we're an operator. Uh, we're a supplier and also uh, in the affiliate space as well. Completed a number of M&A transactions through the last four years um, and also previously I've been in the industry about 20 years going through a number of different M&A transactions across various different guises and businesses. Matt? I'm Matt, not Paris. Um, and I'm the founder of The Game Day. Uh, the Game Day is a media business based in the US. Um, we also make a lot of money from FTDs so we're sometimes seen as an affiliate. Um, I think my interest around M&A is um, maybe sort of riding two horses. First is we founded the business uh, about two and a half years ago and very quickly saw that it was a consolidating market. Um, US focused um, growth, um, Europeans trying to enter the US. And we've engaged in a number of conversations even though um, the business only has about 70 people in it. And so I think I've seen um, you know, a number of different approaches to um, a consolidated approach around the US market. That's kind of piece one. Piece two is my track record is starting and selling businesses. So I've had three exits and the last was a very clever acquisition by Sky of my last startup where um, we were a large online media business and they very cleverly paired us up with Skybet post acquisition and created a lot of value. So I've seen uh, and lived through some really successful M&A. I'm the, um, the village idiot in the room in comparison. Um, I've been doing M&A in the sector for the last 25 years. Um, I've built and run um, a couple of boutique businesses and recently joined Partis where we're very excited to have just so far done a billion dollars of transactions so far this year, um, selling a couple of businesses to Entain and a whole bunch of other things in between. Um, and before this I was um, with the Rank Group where I was the CSO for five years. Um, where I built, bought, um, and ran their international business as well. Um, and before that, I was out of Macau, where I was the SVP of development for the Galaxy Group, um, which is a $20 billion-ish casino operator in Macau. Spent a lot of time um, working out where to take that next. Excellent. So we have quite a diverse panel. We've got a broker who deals with M&A, both buy side and sell side. We've got a startup who actually has track record and multiple exits. We actually have a hybrid, because you've done, you've done both. So it's going to be quite interesting. So first off, let's have a, a generic question. What's the state of the M&A market right now, right? Presumably, you're seeing a lot of deals. I'm seeing a lot of deals. You're seeing a lot of deals. But have those deals increased in quality? I'm going to start with you, Paul. I think the short answer is it depends. I think there is a flight towards quality at the moment. The speculative M&A that was particularly in the US sector um, as people were starting up and trying to grab land has dried up. I think as people have realized that you know, profitability is something that is quite important. Um, people are putting money to work. Entain, Flutter are putting money to work and they'll buy below their trading multiple every day of the week, pull out synergies and then rinse and repeat and do it again and again. So Entain's bought three businesses so far this year, yep. all local heroes, all in you know, emerging markets or good markets on the back of new regulation. Excellent. Um, what do you think, Matt? I mean, I have a US focus, and I think the US market is um, kind of ripe for consolidation. It feels like new operators are springing up consistently on the operator side. I mean, there are customers, and I think we've gone from 12 significant customers this time last year to 22 now. And I think we'd be naive to think that that's less than 100 in two years' time. Um, so that's one side of it, and that doesn't really speak to my, my opening point was around consolidation. But I think you'll both see niche players and rapid consolidation on the operator side to get on one side to profitability and the other side 
slightly more speculative plays. Yeah. Within the sports media sector, it's an incredible uh, moment in time because there's found money. Uh, these are businesses that were highly profitable anyway, and now they're super high profitable businesses. Um, so you're seeing, whether it's on the broadcast side or all the way down to my domain, which is on the digital media side, massive investment. And one of our competitors just raised $100 million for a wildly unprofitable business at a $500 million valuation from the largest, right. richest man in the world. Yep. I agree with that. So tec <laughs> tec technically, we're still drinking the Kool-Aid. You'd hope. <laughs> um, David, what do you think? Um, I'll, um, I'll stay away from the US and the focus okay. is there for, for yourself. But uh, in, ter in terms of uh, European businesses, I mean, there are a number of businesses at the moment that are available on the market. Um, many, bo both across uh, operators, across regulated markets, um, suppliers as well. Um, not so many affiliates that are being flogged around. Um, it's more about um, smaller investments. Uh, the affiliates are more on the in, in the US side of things uh, that are available. But certainly the smaller regulated markets, um, those operators that maybe at one time um, were seen as they could have a huge opportunity in that regulated market, just haven't made it. Uh, it's a, it's a break-even scenario, and there's a lot of them available at the moment for the, for the pickings. Um, but generally, you'd probably only pick them up for the licenses uh, because yep. they are challenging markets, regulated markets. There's a, there's a great uh, M&A opportunity. There's a lot of these, right? Right now, just buying semi-distressed assets, right? With, with some good bits on them, being a license, be it some usable tech, right? There's a lot of that. There's, there's, there's this almost this middle layer of M&A, right? Where uh, I know because I've been involved in a lot of this stuff, right? Some of which, you, actually, most of which you can't talk of. But all these distressed assets, right? With a little bit of great IP, that's probably worth building up something to someone, right? And there is, there is a market of this. It's, it's, it's like a junk bond market, if you've ever been involved in the junk bond market. You just need to know how to pick them up. But it does mean, at least from my perspective and my experience, that the M&A market is becoming more fragmented, not less. In the US, you might think it's different, right? Because it's, there's, there's massive valuations, everyone's looking at uh, top line as opposed to the cost of acquisition. I'd like to understand if that's sustainable. So I'd like your perspective, David. Um, I'd argue that uh, the top line focus has already started to disappear. I agree. With that. Um, and certainly, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking to investors in the US with a view to, to our business. Um, but I'm also looking at investments uh, for, from our business perspective and also as, a, as, a, um, as an angel investor as well, privately. And, you know, personally, I, I definitely look at the opportunities in terms of uh, the, the top line still. But from a company perspective, it's still very, very much now around the bottom line. Uh, if a company isn't profitable or very, very close there too, then the interest is definitely waning. Um, and I think we'll see more and more of that over the course of the next six months for sure. That, I think it's started to happen at an accelerated rate, right? So six months ago, people weren't looking at bottom line. They're just looking at top line because top line is important. We don't care about acquisition costs, don't worry. Then DraftKings posts uh, a quarter on quarter series of worrying forecasts, right? And everyone just falls off a cliff, right? Now, to be fair, it isn't just gaming, right? The whole tech market has taken a massive haircut because of what's going on in the US. However, if you do look at gaming stocks, they still are incredibly good value when you compare them with the FANG stocks, right? This is what nobody really understands, right? So respective of how bad DraftKings or Flutter seems on a, on a, on a particularly bad day, they're still really good value for money, if that makes sense. But do you agree, Matt? Um, I think, let's you know, bring it back to the US, I think the, the top line piece is maybe the froth has come off of that. Um, I think the profitability side is very, very challenging. And it's challenging because there's only probably a quarter of the country opened up for sports gaming and maybe a tenth of the company opened up for any right. kind of real money gaming. And so what we prefer to do, and we're looking actively at how to play into this market because we have an, a nice position, we started at the right place at the right time, <clears throat> is to find operating leverage. And so really, for, for us, when we look at the listed comps, where we really, really worry is when they add another 50 million of revenue, announce a big growth figure, but the profitability and margins either didn't go up or sat stagnant. Right. And that's hugely worrying, because as a media business, when a new state opens or a new territory opens, to broaden the, 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 the argument, that should be entirely net, new net margin into the company. There shouldn't not be a new cost to that other than a very small licensing cost. And if you're an at-scale business, that's a rounding error. 
And so I, I really feel that understanding where companies have operating margin in the US is really where we're putting our chips. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Paul, what's your perspective from a, an M&A perspective? Well, I think it, it, it's very interesting. She puts it, DraftKings and then a Flutter in the same conversation, they're a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. DraftKings doesn't make any money. They're sitting on an amount of money that is going to have to last them until they can either raise more money or make money. Flutter has got a cash cow sitting in Europe just throwing money into its annual marketing engine. And you know, 53% of the market is, is what happens when you do that. Yep. So completely different in terms of animals. Um, Flutter can afford to go out and buy stuff. Flutter has access to capital. DraftKings can only buy stuff with shares. And you saw what happened when they tried to buy Entain. So you know, that emperor is walking around without a stitch on as far as capital markets and M&A is concerned. Um, they've managed to pull off the golden nugget transaction for stock at a time when sentiment was entirely in a different direction. There's no way on earth that would happen now. So I think you've got to look very much at the quality of the asset, the reason why people are doing things, and whether people can actually afford to buy as a reason to actually believe whether M&A is even going to happen at all. Because at the moment, it's very hard to find debt. You know, you're looking at the William Hill 888 debt, two billion of debt has yet to syndicate because the buyers aren't there for it. Um, I just advised CVC on buying Gaming One. We syndicated 350 million of debt, which we thought we'd do in half an hour. It took three weeks. Wow. So all, all the of the price of that debt changes. <laughs> no, the price, <laughs> went, we were happy with yeah. the way the price went out, thank God, because it happened before <laughs> Kwarteng went and did what he did yesterday, yeah. but, or Friday. But ultimately, You've got to look at all of these various pieces. M&A isn't just, I'm buying, you're selling. It's with what, why are you doing it? What are you going to do with it when you've bought it? Yeah. And all of a sudden, just going out and buying stuff because it's there doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I agree with that. That makes perfect sense. Look, I think there's a reason why we're asking this question, by the way. We are going to bring it back to the whole startup scene. But key to, key to a, a, an M&A, &A, a successful M&A outcome, is, is debt but also capital, right? And right now, there are very limited sources where you can get reliable capital. That's, that's the honest truth. There's a lot of M&A funded activity that has to come from the bond market, that has to come from a separate debt, right? And it, until a, a year ago, it, debt was cheap, right? It was really easy to get debt funding, right? It's no longer anymore, right? Look, look what's happening with the Bank of England, right? Bank of England is having to increase its interest rates on a weekly basis, right? Now, whether you think it's just going to be some headache for homeowners or mortgage owners, truth of the matter is the whole ripple effect, right? The whole supply chain feels that, including the startups itself. Which, which I guess leads me to the next question. Is this the right time to sell your business? David, what do you think? No. <laughs> um, um, I think sorry, I'm just thinking about our own business. <laughs> no. um, you know, I think, uh, well, for, for one, of course, valuations are being pressed anyway. Um, so it's really important that one, one makes sure that you, you get as much valuation for the business as possible. Um, two, you know, I think, I think now is probably the time to do a lot of the, the heavy lifting in the background in order to prepare mm. for when it's right to sell your business. Yep. Um, so that's probably, you know, could be nine, could be 12, who's got the crystal ball uh, months ahead in the future. Um, and our, and or uh, list the business. You know, now is certainly not the time for that either. Um, so I'd say if, you, if you've got a great asset, continue building it. Continue making sure that you've got a really, really solid asset there that starts to generate a lot of value on the bottom line because the times will go, come good again and, and then it'll be the time to sell, but not now. Nat, would you go funding now or would you wait? I, th I flip the question on its head. I think now is a good time to be a buyer. Yep. Um, because cash is scarce. Um, opportunities are clearer than they were because a lot of, you know, to coin Warren Buffett, you, when the tide goes out, you see who's wearing a swimsuit. And there's a lot of naked bodies around. Uh, and they're not that pretty to look at. No. So I think what's <laughs> remaining is pretty attractive. And so that's really where, as, as I said, we're focusing our time. And, and I gave, oversimplified with operating margin, but it's very helpful yep. as, a real, as a key kind of discipline of management or maybe where someone sits in the value chain. There's going to be a lot of uh, stressed assets out there in the market in the not too distant future. You know, okay, you know, in the previous discussion, we talked about the lucky people who took the cash when it was available. Yep. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people out there that need the cash and it's just not going to happen. I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm really worried about the, the, the funding market, the investment side of the M&A market in the next three months. 
because we will, we will get to this perfect storm, right? Where it's going to be really expensive, right, for a VC to give capital to a business, right? Because it needs to hold on to some top up rounds with existing businesses. And we're going to find a lot of startups that actually do need proper growth capital, not because they're distressed, but because they need to scale. So we're going to see a lot of genuinely great businesses, right, actually going to struggle because the normal, the normal capital mechanisms are in there in place. And but it, even at the other end of the spectrum, though, even in the, you know, the larger cap businesses, cost of debt has gone up, refinancing requirements you know, don't wait, you know, they sit on a calendar basis. So if you're coming towards the end of a term loan or a revolving credit facility, you've got to go and get refinanced right now, you're paying 5 6% more than you were, that's a chunk. And everyone talks about EBITDA. EBITDA is a fantastic way of measuring performance of a business, but cash is what really matters. Mm. And you can't run a business on EBITDA. You can run a business on cash. And that's the other thing that's going to come through, is people are going to start valuing their businesses and looking at investments on a cash basis. And that's all the private equity guys are going to come in to do as well. At the moment, private equity cannot really stick a toe into DraftKings, by way of example, because there's no cash to leverage. And until that comes through, and until they can see that, you're going to be putting in, what, well, umpteen billion of, of equity and then funding the losses right yeah yeah it does happen sadly more especially more recently yeah okay so we have a problem right we have a problem because we've got good startups that need capital right and at some point um, what are we going to do with them so if you were a startup right right now what what advice would you give a startup particularly if they're going to need capital in the very near future Take what you can when you can to begin with, uh, for sure. Um, make sure you surround yourselves with uh, people from the industry who are able to bring the money into the table. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And do, do not go full speed ahead, assuming the money will be there. Um, make sure that you make a very conservative plan in your, uh, in your forecasts, and, uh, and then you should be fine. Yeah, I think managing, managing your own destiny right now is incredibly important. And I, I guess when we look at <clears throat> really the two pillars, the cheapest source of capital is revenue. Right. And so for us, that really is, you know, it's a, when I said the right place at the right time, that is really where we are very fortunate in that, you know, the business does make real cash. <clears throat> and because we're in the media sector, it is real cash. And there's very, you know, our DNA wouldn't pay for coffee at this conference. So I guess in trend, there's no debt in the company. So it really is a pure cash translation. And I, I think that I've mentioned cash too many times. I'll put that aside. I was just going to keep going, but I'll put that aside. The other pillar is, um, and this may be a good fortune, or maybe it's because my, the co-founder and I have worked together for 20 years. So we got really good support from people and we had the right institutions and individuals. And so that's been really helpful and that kind of non-cash support is actually also really, really valuable and it saves time uh, and it's, it saves money and it also keeps you from talking bullshit. And yeah. I think that really this is a, this is a, a market that is um, constrained. If I look beyond iGaming, we have it good. Yes. Um, and it is an incredibly capital constrained market at at the moment, I'm Canadian, and you know, I talked to my former banker friends, and it's across oil and gas, which is, is trading at, if not near, all-time highs, especially on a currency-adjusted basis, and they're having trouble finding funding. Mm. And that's absurd. Yes. Yeah, it's a very ironic time we live in. Paul, what's your perspective if you were a startup? I think the key thing is, before you go looking for money, is to make sure you've got a concept that actually, to the early conversation, people understand. And if you've got proof of concept in some way or form, whether that be an email from someone who says, if you build this, I will buy it, or whatever it happens to be, that is the crack in the door that will get you through into a conversation. Because at the moment, the doors are mostly shut for new money. That's a very fair point. I should say our first, my first call was to my former partner at Skybat. Who he, I ran my business, he ran and founded his. So yeah, it's probably, I skipped that part of the record. I have a slightly more... Um, vicious uh, piece of advice. If you're a live business, right, which has runway, and that runway expires soon, you're going to need to multiple some things. Simple. If you're not going to run out of cash and you're not getting the cash you want, you do one of two things, right? You either lower your valuation, which is going to be a problem, right, because you might risk taking a down round, or you need to multiple certain operations. You actually need to go on some low burn. Because it's true, there's, there is no cash out there because right now mm -hmm. cash is a, at a premium. People are inherently valuing risk at a significant amount of premium. And that's, a, that's an issue. 
It's a short-term thing, that's the good news. It's a short-term thing. At some point, it will correct. At some point, the commodity markets will stabilize. And as we know from economics, after commodity stabilizes, then the rest of the markets start to grow. I have a few more questions, but first I want to see if any one of you has been through this and anyone has anything to share or importantly to ask. Questions? Go on. You all, you all have startups, guys. Let's, let's not bullshit the room. What are your challenges? What do you want to know? Is it time for a beer? <laughs> we, have a bra we have a brave gentleman here. Thank you. In this industry, when somebody decides to buy a business, they decide based on EBITDA on, or, on how pro or on the cash. Good. You, so one, you've stolen one of my questions for the end, so well done on that. But secondly, it's actually a very good point, because what are the values right, on which a buyer actually looks for acquiring? Right? So, it's actually a tricky question, and I'm going to let my very esteemed panel answer it, but the truth of the matter is the TLDR is that's actually changed even over the last year. Okay, truth of the matter. We'll, we'll get into the specifics as to what, but over the last year that has changed. David, do you want to elaborate? There's a, there's a lot of variables there. Um, you know, and, and the main one is at what stage is the business? Um, you know, in the early days, um, you know, I, I, I would invest mainly in the people, the product and the concept um, because cash is just not there generally. Um, if it was a strategic investment, it could be particular geography. Um, in, when it comes to uh, cash or EBITDA, now I would actually go for cash. <laughs> um, previously, <laughs> if you'd have asked me two years ago, I would have gone for top line. Uh, and future opportunity, um, but that's changed now. Yeah, very much so. Matt, what's your experience? Uh, I mean, I would have to say there's a there's a couple other variables here. the The first one that comes to mind, and this is as someone who sells bit starts at sales businesses, is you really it's a bit like entering a nightclub. And if there's sort of one pretty person who likes the look of you, it's it's a it's a pretty difficult nightclub to navigate, right? It's a pretty small place. So ideally what you want to have is a table of pretty people who all think you're really interesting, or even a whole nightclub of people that think you're really interesting. And I remember when I was in my single days, which is, you know... They, I, I like how you're pivoting to this, by the way. They, they, <laughs> you know, they barely had lights in the nightclub, and there certainly was a lot of cigarette smoke, but you tried to stand in a well-lit place. So that, or by the washrooms, because there's a lot of people coming and going. But they, I'm telling you too much, more than you need to know. But the idea what is... What nightclubs do you actually go to? <laughs> <laughs> the idea is you re to, to have something that people want. And I, that's, I think, when you talked about having your, 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 your kind of punctuation point on my rambling piece on how to create value, I think the punctuation point on this is have something that people want. Yeah, for one example is RegTech, right? We talked about this on the previous panel, right? If you're in the registry, or the, regis uh, the regulation or compliance business, which is previously the most unsexy business in the entire history of the universe, right? Try running a compliance <laughs> business if you know what unsexy looks like. My God, the suicide rates in those industries must be incredibly high. They were un unsexy until a year ago, right? Now all of a sudden the valuation is going through the roof. I'm getting multiples on those businesses, right? Based on turnover, on future turnover. Right? It's insane. Why? Because we know the US wants them. They are, of a sudden, the pretty girl who's never been in a nightclub before and, of a sudden, has gone in, and, of a sudden, everybody wants a piece of that business. <laughs> if that makes sense, right? <laughs> and, and, therein lies, and therein lies the opportunity. Now, as, as a VC, we have to be selfish, right? We have to say, where's the next opportunity going to lie? But then, as a startup, it also means, how are you going to make yourself more attractive when you're in the club? Right? What's the lipstick you're going to apply? Right? What's the hair gel you're going to apply to make yourself more attractive when you're down there? But it's true, right? This is what you have to do. Because otherwise, and this is the biggest, I think, takeaway from the current market right now, if you don't market yourself, if you don't make yourself super attractive to be super unique, if you don't Tinderize your own game profile, investors won't find you. Trust me on that. There's way too much noise in the industry. There's one takeaway I've found in the last 12 months, the signal-to-noise ratio has just gone through the floor. It's simple. So there's a lot more businesses looking for a lot more funding. A couple of them actually are really good. We just can't see them through the noise. That's the absolute truth. I think it comes, to, well, coming back to the question again on, you know, how do you 
I think cash and EBITDA are both ways of valuing a business. That you don't buy them for either of them. You buy them if they're profitable. But normally you're buying a business for exactly that reason. It's a fit. It's something you require, whether it's a new market, a new product, whatever else. And then the, you know, the scale and the ability to grow from where it currently is to where you think it's going to grow, that all becomes part of this first, the, the, the first round of questions. But the absolute first question is, why do I want this? Do I want to have you know, a reg tech business to bolt onto my geocomply business? Do I want to have a Spanish business to bolt onto my Portuguese business? Whatever it happens yep. to be, it always comes down to commercial need, then value, then can I transact, then can I integrate, and integration is, by the way, one of the most untalked about things and is the really? most important piece. And Tain are really successful at acquiring businesses and integrating them. They do it over and over again. Other businesses buy a business. I can think of one in, in Israel in particular who currently have got seven HR departments, seven re um, finance departments. They are a household name tech supplier. They've made seven acquisitions and they've never integrated them. They just stuck them all in one room. And you just sit there and go, but how? Hoped it will work. <laughs> and yep. funnily enough, it's a fairly dysfunctional business. Yeah, it's funny that. We only have time for closing round because the hot six is starting downstairs. I'd like some closing notes, but also any hot investment picks you would uh, choose right now. David, Ooh. you go first. Uh, maybe I should just plug all my own. Yeah, uh, besides besi <laughs> Glitno. <laughs> yes, okay, besides besi Glitno, yeah. Um, I think uh, first and foremost, whilst everybody's looking at the US, um, go south. Um, so most definitely go towards Latin America um, in terms of investments. Um, look for the opportunities that, that are not operators. There are maybe, gosh, uh, three, four hundred operators focused on a single market. Um, so don't, don't go there, uh, but focus around the peripheries. Um, then I'd also look uh, still, okay, now I will be looking at the US, uh, but I'd look at sports, but with, a, with an angle. Um, I think that's interesting. Um, you know, there are a lot of operators in the US and we all know that they're not making any money. Um, so look at what products could make money in the near to short term in that market using sports where it's regulating at a very high pace. Yeah. Very true. I, th I think Latam is very hot right now. Mm -hmm. I would invest a lot there. Matt, what's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, the perspective we have, and we're active, is that we think that there's um, a real disconnect between, I guess it's quality and pricing in the public market. Um, and quality, uh, because these are uncovered stocks that are operating in our world, which is like marketing services, call it affiliate sort of broadly, if you look at that comps table, there's like six or eight businesses there, some of which are very high quality, others of which are maybe not as high quality, to be polite. And I think that the, um, the to go back to my tide going out piece, the tide has gone out. You can see who has their shorts on, see who doesn't have their shorts on. But f because they're such small businesses and because people have really stopped investing in um, small cap publicly listed businesses, particularly in certain regions, there's value there that's just been abandoned. And so I think that when you talked earlier about maybe small companies that have, have you know, real gems that sit within them, right. there's actually quite big companies that have gems within them um, that are trading at, um, you know, they're called, to go back to Warren Buffett, cigarette butt yep. valuations. Yep. And, and I think that that's an interesting opportunity in the right hands. And some of those cigarette butts deserve to go in the ashtray and others should be picked up and smoked like a quality cigar. Yeah, very. I love your analogies, man. Thank that you. Just, just <laughs> Paul, closing words from you. So it's two things really. I think if you've currently got a business and you're thinking about selling it, I would actually say, well, think about buying something in the meantime. Because there isn't really a market out there. There are not you know, a nightclub full of pretty girls out there looking for you right now. But if you, you know, can go and buy a better pair of shoes or you know, a shorter dress or whatever it happens to be, then you know, go out, do that, and, and put yourself in a position so when the market does come back, and it always does, and I've been through two rounds of these, and it, it's, it's always painful, but it's not painful for too long because people start calling the bottom and then they start coming back in looking for quality. But I think ultimately you know, positioning yourself by maybe buying things that you see value in that others don't is always a good thing to do. Yep. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, if you do want to go down that path towards an exit, prepare for it. The 
biggest disasters on every deal I've seen have come from people going, oh, I didn't know that about their own business. <laughs> yeah. and, and that comes out in due diligence, and it's the worst possible thing you yeah. could do. Yeah. And if you've been misbehaving in the Netherlands or whatever else, be upfront about it. And Don't it. shove it under a rock and hope no one finds it, because they're really good at picking up rocks <laughs> all the way through to sand, as we heard earlier from Blackstone. A AKA responsible disclosures, ladies and gents. That's a very important clause in the contract you'll end up signing one day. True story. Okay, so thank you for that. That's really insightful. So we're going to summarize because this is really important. Is this the right time to raise capital? No, it's not. If you're on the VC side, it's a great time to, raise to invest in businesses because they're all depressed, right? If you're running low on fuel, right, you've got little runway, try and extend that as much as possible. Make some sacrifices. Simple. But make sure you are as attractive as possible, right? in an androgynous environment, right? Pretty girls, pretty goys, pretty anything, right? In a club, just make sure you're attractive. Make sure you're unique, more importantly, right? The, the Tinder analogy is actually good because you, you are in a marketplace. And the whole marketplace is based on desirability. And look, I'm telling you from experience, VCs, we don't spend a lot of time looking at assets, right? We're going to see the first page of a deck, second page tops. Totally. And then we'll know. Honestly, at some point, there's going to be so many decks, we're just going to go whoosh, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. True story, right? Most BAs in a VC fund don't spend the amount of time they should because there's a lot of noise. And the signal-to-noise ratio is really low. But if you find that niche, you shout above the rooftops, and one VC will hear you. And then that's the time to raise. Okay? That's all the time we have for. Thank you very much for being part of the Invest Track. See you next year. Thank you, guys. Thank you.